The home, the home game um, with about 25, 30 minutes to go in Holloway threw, threw me on a, at nil nil, and um, I came on to change the game. Whoa, 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 whoa! Have you hit that subscribe button? If not, what are you waiting for? Do it. What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the Total Sport YouTube channel, and today we've got a very, very special guest, a veteran of football and non-league football in particular, Mr. Richard Paquette. How are you, mate? I hope I've pronounced that right. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, not too bad, mate. I'm all right. <laughs> yeah, it's great to great to have Richard on. As you can see, he's got a QPR tracksuit on, one of his first clubs, which is class. Um, and he's what most well known in particular uh, for scoring a specific goal. But we'll talk we'll talk firstly about just the the career he's had because it's still going and it's crazy. Um <laughs> I think I counted 38 clubs, Richard. Is that right? Yeah, I think it's that. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, lost count. Um, <laughs> even though some of them added were some some in the early days were loans when I was at QPR, went on loan a few times and stuff like that. So, and then the rest are where non-league where you do a stint for a season and you're not moving on for whatever reason. But yeah, it's quite a few clubs, but experience. Exactly, mate. Exactly. So we'll start off at the very beginning, mate. Where, where did the love of football start for you? Um, from a kid, from a young kid, um, I've always loved football. Um, my dad used to play semi-pro football as well. I used to go and watch him play quite a lot. So I've always wanted to play football. I've always liked love football. Um, I used to play in the playground in primary school at the time. I played for my school. I've always played for my school team. So I've always wanted to be a footballer. Yeah, and um, in particular, were you always focused on being a striker from a young kid? Um, because a lot of players like change positions throughout their career. Yeah. Um, was it always a focus for you? Yeah, I've always been a striker. I've always wanted to score goals. I've always loved scoring goals. Um, I've always had a decent strike on me as well as a kid. So it's, it's just followed me all, all the way, you know? Yeah, definitely. So Queen's Park Rangers, you still got the, the tracksuit on. Um, where did it all start with them? Did they pick you up from uh, a local club? Yeah, so um, I played for my school's borough, which was Brent at the time. I went to school in Brent, my secondary school in Brent. Um, so uh, we played played loads of games against all the different other boroughs around around uh, London and stuff. Um, I didn't get scouted by QPR from here directly. Um, I got scouted by Norwich at first. I was at Norwich for a little bit. Um, then my cousin used to play for QPR at the time. He was a few years older than me. I suppose he used to go and watch and things like that. And then in in my year group at QPR was a lot of players was in my county team. Brent, was, he played for your county as well, which was Middlesex. So all the best players in Middlesex um, schools played for the county. And quite a lot of them were at QPR. But then um, one day I just asked the manager if I could come train him. And then it just went on from there. If you don't ask, you don't get, right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. You know, I put myself out there a bit and it happened. I knew I was good enough anyway because I played with most of the players that were there anyway, you know? So it was, it was good. So I went there, I went on trial. I joined towards the end of the season on trial and they asked me to come out the following season and then the rest was history after that. Yeah, amazing. I think I read somewhere uh, in my research for doing this that you actually play alongside Peter Crouch at QPR. Yeah, I did. Um, when I made my debut in the old Division One, the year we, um, the season we got relegated, um, Peter Crash was on loan from uh, Tottenham at the time. Yeah, so uh, I made my debut, played up front with him. And um, I don't know if everyone remembers Chris Cormier, he used to be at Arsenal and Ipswich. Yeah, and Gavin Peacock, he used to be at Chelsea. So I played, I played alongside them for my games. That's quite cool, isn't it? So. In terms of like playing up front with us, uh, you've probably you've played up front with probably a lot of different strikers played by yourself up top. Uh, what's it like playing with someone of that stature? Um, Tiffany Crouch is only a few years older than me, so he was a young lad as well. <laughs> yeah, so, I, mean, I mean, maybe even talking height. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a big lad. And when he first came, I was thinking he's tall, he's skinny. Um, but you know what? For a big guy like that, he's got great feet and a great touch. And which is surprising sometimes. And and I think a lot of defenders were quite surprised when he first came on the scene. 
uh, technically good he, he, he was. So, yeah, Crouchy was good to play with and a lovely, a lovely guy as well. Yeah, definitely. You can obviously you listen to him and on TV and in his podcast and stuff like that. So definitely a really nice guy. And do you think that like people nowadays, if you're going to be a target man, which is like a dying art in my opinion, uh, you have to be like really technically good. Yeah, you got to be technically good. You got to be brave. You got to be strong, and you you have to understand that being a target man, a lot relies on you for the team and things start start from you to where. The midfielders and the wingers and stuff get into the game once once you're that target man and you've got a good touch, you need to bring them into play. So if it breaks down from you, then a lot of these players might not get into the game as much. Yeah, cracking. So more more on you. Um, I saw that you obviously played you played a few loan spells away at Q, from QPR and then came back and played in a particular game. Um, the both semi-finals of a playoff uh, to the second division as it was then. Um, and then the final, which unfortunately lost to Cardiff, which is my hometown now, which is cool. Yeah. Um, but talk to me about that experience. Obviously, being quite an inexperienced player at the time, um, how was that to, to be involved in something like that? Yeah, to be fair, um, obviously, I had my sniffs the season before. Um, came back that season. I got injured. I was injured in the summer. Uh, let myself go a bit. Came back. Not as fit as I should have been, should have done. Um, had a kick up the backside, uh, so that's why I went on loan for a few, uh, few times. Um, came back, got my head down, and the manager Ian Holloway just said, "Right, I'll give you a run of games." Because on when I was on loan, I was doing the business, and at the time was in a, in a rough spell, you know. And a lot of the fans were happy because they had a homegrown player scoring goals for another team when he could be helping up the team. Um, came back in, um, I had a good run in the side, uh, scored a few goals. Um, scored a, my first game back from my loan was Barnsley at home. I scored in that one, we won 1 0. Played for Mifford Way, I scored in that one, we won 1 0. Um, had a good run, have, having good games. Then I had a, a little knock. And then um, when I came back fit, we we're still doing well. So I was on the bench and coming on and always changed, doing well when I was coming on. And then obviously we got. Obviously, we finished in the playoffs. And then um, I was on the bench in the first leg of the uh, playoffs against Oldham away. Came on with about 15 to go, done well. And then the home the home game um, with about 25, 30 minutes to go in Holloway threw, threw me on at 0-0. And um, I came on and changed the game, stretched the game. And even though I didn't score, but I had a very good half hour. And that that's what warranted my, my start in the final against Cardiff Cardiff because of how when I came back from my injury and the impact I was making coming off the bench um, warranted my start in the final against Cardiff yeah and unfortunately uh, you guys lost out in that one but I'm sure you don't need reminding um, but yeah so do you think then back back in throughout your career you've had you've started games come on and do you think maybe the fact that you can provide this impact and you have provided this impact have helped your career go so far um a lot of it is it's helped me yeah but it shows sometimes i know when i'm having a run of games and things like that what i can produce you know, um and then as my experience is obviously when i left qpr my experiences then obviously my mindset changed a bit. I've had to dig it, had to dig it deeper within myself, rest out of myself, and start believing in my ability a bit more because I started doubting myself because I weren't where I should be at the time. You know, and maybe that's helped me have a, a good non league career, even though I wanted to get back in football league, it never happened. But like I've had to dig deep and started having that belief about myself and thinking, yeah, I'm a good player. And, and when you get that confidence back in yourself and you feel a bit free and you learn of where you're at at that time, you start excelling and things start in and you start having a decent career. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we do a lot on this channel about sort of mentality and how you guys and elite athletes think. And um, what was your mentality like when you first made the drop into non-league permanently? Did you? What was the what was the thought process going going through your head? It was hard. It was very hard. Um, I, I was I turned down certain contracts in the Conference Premier at the time, trying to stay in the football league. 
And I think that, that was the big mistake. You know, because I was thinking, being at QPR from the age of 13, I know I'm good enough at that level. I should be playing that level. And it's that it's the fear of having to try and start again. And then when you have sniffs and nothing materialises, and then you end up being there, you know, you have to, you do have to just come to terms with it. It's hard, you know, and a lot of young players find that adjustment tough because then you have to start thinking about, I'm going to have to work and things like that and finding the balance, you know, and when you've got good people around you, it does it does help a little bit and it, and it is hard. But um, I found it tough in the beginning. I, I'll, I'll be honest with that, I found it tough, you know, and then you see them, you play against players that know you and if they start asking you why you're at this level and things like that. And all that mentally, all that sort of thing starts in your head. And, you know, and then you, you, you forget sometimes of, you, you're actually a good player because you wouldn't have got there if you wasn't a good player, you know? So then, so then you just have to just try and get yourself back around and just dig deep in it. I can I get there if I don't, I don't. But as long as I know, I tried my best. Definitely, mate. And that's that's the way. And talking of like work and stuff, when you first tried to foray into the world of work and having football at the same time, how did you manage to scra- to cram that in? Because there's a lot of big challenge being a semi-professional footballer. Uh, I found it diff- difficult. Very difficult. Everyone, everyone would. I've never worked in my life until until I had to come in a non-league, you know. Um, and then my first proper non-league side where I signed properly for a whole majority of the season was Worthing. So I was travelling from London to Worthing, yeah. Um, twice a week, three times a week. Um, then I started working and then I was leaving work and then getting home at midnight and then getting up in the morning. Uh, and I'll be, and I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't find time to do ex- extra bit of training to look after myself. Then I did put on a bit of weight. I went in probably the best best bit of shape I, that I should be as a young player, as a young footballer. But it was finding that balance of how can I do extra training as well as work, as well as go to my football club and, and play. Don't get me wrong, my, this is where I started to realise my ability was good because I was still producing, even though I weren't in probably the top shape I should be in, but I was still producing because of the body that I had. But it is, the adjustment is it's hard. But then when you come to grips and set out a plan of what you need to do, whether even if you do two days two, on, on your own, away from the club, in between work, it starts picking up a bit, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, so so moving forward, uh, you talked of your spell at Worthing and then that just a year later you signed for Haven and Waterlooville, yeah. um, which is probably your most well-known spell, probably post-QPR. Um, so talk about signing for them and you ended up having two seasons there. So so uh, how did that how did that come about? So when I was at Worthing, um, I was at Worthing, I was second top scorer at the time or top scorer at the time. I was on I was on good money at the time, um, and then I noticed things started going a bit funny after we got up to and, and things like that. It was I think I joined having in around February, February March, about March time, February March. But before that, I went along to Forrock. So Worthing was in the Roman Premier at the time, and then I went along to Forrock for a month in the Conference South, and then I came back, and then when when I came back to Worthing. Um, and, we're going to want to let you go today. So they paid me up the rest of my contract. And I, I knew Haven't wanted me. So after I got paid up, then I went to Haven't and signed for Haven't from March to the end of the season. And then I, I really enjoyed it under Ian Beard. And um, the players, they were brilliant. And then it was just a club I just felt comfortable there. It was run properly. It was very, prof- it was even though it's a non- non-league club, it, it was run very professional. Um, It just felt like a proper and we had a good decent side and I can see what they're trying to do there, you know, and I enjoyed every moment that happened, you know, um, even to this day, like I was checking their schools and things like that. It's a very, very good football club. Yeah. And of course you can't do an interview with Richard Paquette without talking about that moment. Um, and now I'm going to go into a bit of detail about this because as a Liverpool fan, I was only five, <laughs> like, you won't forgive me again. I was only uh, five years old when this game happened. So, uh, um, but I do actually remember it. And I remember the shock of when non-league Haven't and Waterlooville took the lead at Anfield only two years ago before that, Premier League champions, uh, not Premier League, 
I wish, uh, yeah. Champions League winners. Um, yeah. Describe the feeling, mate. How how did that feel? Um, feeling was unreal. You know, I, I went into the game very confident. Not that I was going to win or anything, but I had a feeling I was going to score. I just had that feeling from when the draw. I just had that feeling. Um, and to get the opportunity to score, and to be fair, I sort of was sniffing at the opportunity during the game. We had a few set pieces before, and I, that they did the zonal marking. We knew about the zonal marking. And if the ball was right, and where I, where I used to stand, my position, my position on the corner, I knew if the ball was right, I'd get a sniff. Quite a few uh, headers from that sort of position during the season anyway. And then um, I just knew if the delivery was right, I'll score during the game and it happened. And when it went in, I'm glad it was in front of the cop. And in a way, I wish it was in the other end because we had so many fans there. I was tempted to run the whole length. I know the family, but I knew I, I would have been too tired. But the feeling was, it was just crazy, crazy feeling. Yeah, it's like sort of sending shockwaves with the with the ball going into the back and that sending shockwaves throughout football, really. Um, and you guys, obviously, you didn't come out on top in the end, but you didn't disgrace yourself whatsoever. Like, you put out an unbelievable uh, performance. What in particular do you take from, and as an, as an in a memory from that game, apart from obviously the goal, um, from that day, what are your main takeaways from it? There's so many. Oh, the build-up. Training before the, the game, training at uh, United Zoo, training around the cliff. So we trained there. Um, there was a lot of TV, a lot of press. Uh, some of the Man United coaching stuff, not the first team, but people around the club were wishing us the best. And then the, the journey on on the, the day of the game to Anfield. And then when we turned the corner on the coach, all the fans clapping us in. Like, Capping us into the stadium and all our fans were there already by the players' entrance. That was amazing. Like it just sent shivers up our spines. And then obviously we warm up on the pitch, buzzing, because you've seen the, it's gonna be a full house, you're buzzing, you've seen your family in the stands. But the moment we're for kickoff, we go in the line up in the tunnel and they start playing, you never walk alone. And then that walk out to the pitch was immense. I, it made it made a few of us like tear up on our way out. I always come out last or second to last in the tunnel, and it's like you come down the stairs, then you walk, then come back up, and you can just gets louder and louder. And it was the, to hear the whole stadium singing it, it was just crazy. Yeah, and, and obviously that's a takeaway. A lot, a lot of players from who've played at Anfield say, um, and having obviously been a regular at the, in the crowd, I can definitely define that as well. Um, so, so moving on from that, um, actually scoring that goal, do you think, and I want to know how your, again, your mentality is about this, having a moment so special like that, do you think that it kind of potentially had an undermining effect on the rest of your career? Because that is literally like, if people say Richard Paquette, you think the goal. Yeah. So is that something that potentially irks you? No, not really. They think about the goal, and that's what everyone says. They say, "Oh, you scored against Liverpool." Yeah, yeah, but because it's, it's Liverpool, so they're always going to revert back to that, that. And they ask me, "Is that the best moment in your career?" Yes, it is probably the best moment in the career. But I started to play a final in Millennium Stadium in front of uh, 70, 80, 70 thousand people. You know what I mean? At the age of nine, nineteen, so that is that in itself is an achievement for me. I made my debut at eighteen. You know, I say about eighteen, so that's that's an achievement. But so, like the Liverpool thing, like that's the first thing. It don't don't really undermine my career. I just look, I just use it, and I use it for myself because I'm still playing. If I do get on the FA Cup run, I got that. That's that's what helps helps me and help my my teammates to drive. You lot can achieve that. I want you lot to achieve that. So you know, what I mean, so I use it to my effect and try and make it in a positive as much as I can yeah and well 12 13 years 12 13 14 years later you're still you're still going so it, it must be it must be helping you um we go to international football um Dominica um so one how did that come about and and two how ready were you for that opportunity um it was sort of brewing for a while and I've got 
a lot of family out there still. Um, right. And there was someone over this in England who had contacts over there, and they were they were trying to get like the British place base players to come and play for the, the national team. Um, because really and truly, if if it was done properly, really properly, Dominica can have Dominica can have a, a really good national team. There's so many players that probably play for played end up playing for England or haven't played for England, but play football league or championship or that can go and play for Dominica. Um, they was negotiating and trying to get us, and then I knew during before the Liverpool game and stuff like that, it was coming up. Um, things got sorted. I had to get my, my Dominica passports sorted and stuff like that and then after the Liverpool game obviously I was called up for the World Cup qualifier against Barbados which is the first time in a long time where Dominica has got that far to if we were beating Barbados with a we had played USA in two legs so it was big for the country so they got a few of us boys from England come and play and, and which was a great experience you know I done the first leg was in Dominica I went went out there for about just under a week to train and stuff my family were happy because they haven't seen me in, in years. Um, we drew 1-1, one, one, I think. And then the first leg I scored on my debut in front of the family. And then the second leg was about 10 days later in Barbados, which is brilliant as well. It's, it's, even though you're playing international football, but you're in nice countries and, and stuff like that. So it was, a, it was a great experience. Yeah, and is it, in terms of having it, Again, obviously, it didn't happen again for you. Is it, is it, would it be something that potentially, if the crazy thing happened and it came about now, would you do it? I'll definitely do it again. Um, like I said, um, it's just not the country's football is not run as smoothly like the other islands. Like I got mates that play for Mon- Montserrat, it's done properly. Players that play for like Antigua and Guyana, it's all done properly. You know, and Grenada, all them other other islands, are, it's done, it's run properly. Um, Dominica just need to get up to the times a bit if they want to be have a decent decent national side with players from overseas, be done properly. You got players that if you're gonna get players from non-league, non-league, some of them are working, they got to get time off. If they're in the football league, you got to be able to communicate with the football with their club and ask even stuff like that. So, if it, if it comes up again, I'll definitely do it again. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. So so since then, you've been pretty much, uh, to put it in no uncertain terms, here, there and everywhere. Um, what, what, why do you think that is? Is it in terms of like the non-league culture? Is it um, work commitments? Or is it just a, a cocktail of pretty much everything? Um, it's a cocktail of everything. Um, and it's probably a non-league culture, which I didn't realise, you know, because... Um, in non league, you get people, a lot of people don't understand, and only non, the non league footballs will understand. You go, go to the clubs, um, they, they, they have a budget at the start of the season, and because a lot of non league clubs don't really do contracts, so they have a budget at the start, start of the season. Um, things don't go well, you get knocked out of the FA Cup early, you, you lose, the team loses a few games. You're not in around the promotion where the club thinks they're going to get promotion, and then Jim and goes and cutting the budget. So if you if you're an ex quality player that's decent money, you're you're one of the first to go because they can get two players for the money that you're on, or three players. You know what I'm saying? So, or you finish the season and you've done you've had a decent season, and there's another team that's probably pushing for it, and they they come calling and they better, better offer, give you a better offer than what you're already on. And obviously, I, I, I've, I've got a daughter, and I was a young, I was a young father at the time back in, when I came out in the league. Um, obviously, I got, I got responsibilities, so I have to look after me and things like that. And whereas I didn't have a steady job until I went to Haven, I had to do what I had to do for myself and my and my family. So that's that's why I feel. But a lot of people think, oh, you've had those as but when you go non league football, when you sign non contracts. You're not guaranteed to last a season sometimes. You go after six weeks, you can go after a, a month, you know. So that's what people understand. I'm used to coming, I'm coming from a background of contract. So when clubs stop giving you contracts, you get injured for four weeks to say we can't pay you that money, but you don't get paid. So that's the way it is, I think. 
Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, you see, you're still still going strong, Rich, and you're doing you're doing great, and that, that's brilliant. So now we're going to ask you a few just generic football questions, really, um, to to finish us off. So I'm going to say, right. So you've got all time footballers. Yeah. Pick your five aside, dead or alive, any player whatsoever, and this is this is a very difficult question. Uh, and do you and do you get in there? That's the question. Yeah, only because I love to play with them. <laughs> <laughs> um, goalkeeper. It's a tough one. Goalkeeper, I'll say. Peter Schmeichel. Uh, you say five aside, yeah? Five aside, yeah. I'll go. Zidane, R9, um, Maldini, uh, I've got Rio Ferdinand in there. There you go. That, that's your five aside, mate. Yeah. It's taken. You're going to have to be on the bench. You're going to have to be on the bench. I wouldn't put, I wouldn't put myself in that. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got Maldini and Ferdinand defending. I mean, yeah. that's not too bad, is it? Yeah. And in total, in, 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 in all of football, who would be your dream person to have for dinner? Mm, that's tough. These are tough questions. <laughs> There's probably a few that I'd like to have dinner with. Just yeah. tough questions. Um, has to be R9. R9 wouldn't be a bad one. He's, 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 um, he's always been my favorite from 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 the from young. Like, I used to just I just love the way he plays and his power, his pace, his skills, the way he finishes. I've always, I've always loved R9. Definitely, mate. Well, there we go. That is uh, the conclusion to our interview with Rich. Thank you very much for joining us, mate. Where can people find you on social media and all that? I'm on I'm on Twitter, only Twitter, which is um, Richard Paquette nine. I think it is. I can't remember my Twitter name. But just yeah. type in Richard Paquette and you'll find me. Yeah, exactly, mate. And uh, yeah, thank thank you once again for coming on. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. And for you lot at home, uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button. It'd be really greatly appreciated. And we will see you in the next episode. Bye-bye.